Hello. I don't know who's out there, but welcome to you, wherever you are, whether you're joining me live now on the Bristol Ensemble at Home series, or afterwards as this video gets archived. Um, my name is Jonathan James. I'm delighted to be here and to uh, be speaking about Sibelius's Fifth Symphony. I want to give a shout out to Rog Huckle, who's the artistic director of the Bristol Ensemble. I want to thank him particularly for giving me this chance just to speak again. It's lovely to be doing this in isolation. Now, I don't know how you've been navigating these very unsettled times, but I know that a lot of us have been leaning on music far more than ever before. And it got me thinking, because this, is a, this was a, an open brief, you know, what should I speak about? It got me thinking, well, which piece of music always and without fail lifts me up which music makes me happy you know and obviously within the orchestral sphere because we're on the Bristol Ensemble uh, at home and I thought of Sibelius's Fifth Symphony there's so much event in it you know um, I would say in those 30 minutes there's some of the most joyful music that Sibelius ever wrote. And let's just think about what, what is it in music that generally makes you feel uplifted and joyful? I can think of three things. Typically, for a talk, three things to do like that. Well, here, here we go. One, big tunes, big memorable tunes. Do you agree? Something that you can hum in the shower afterwards. Does Sibelius Five have that? Absolutely. A plenty. We're all waiting for that moment, right? In the last movement, the so called swan hymn. Yeah, that's the moment, isn't it, of the symphony? But let me just reassure you there are many other broad themes to look forward to as well. One, big tunes. Two, <clears throat> a sense of wind. Um, and of transcendence, you know, and so many composers have used that model since. I'm thinking of Borjak, Brahms, Mahler. Um, and Sibelius, in his own way, has that wonderful trajectory to this fifth symphony as well. It's very much about lightness and uh, positivity, transcending uh, dark and doom. So we've got that, and that's tremendously uplifting in and of itself. And thirdly, what do we have? What do we expect? We expect a build-up of tension, don't we? From pieces that uplift us. We want something that builds and builds and builds, and we have that payoff, that wonderful sense of climax. And ideally, it would be structured that the largest climax is saved for the end, for the finale. And that's very much the case here in the Fifth Symphony. So three big ticks there for big tunes, a sense of light over dark and big build-ups. And if you think of those in novelistic terms, big tunes translates to having memorable, lovable characters. And you could say the struggle musically that we find so satisfying is akin to a sense of jeopardy, right, in a novel and uh, feeling engaged because of that. And finally, the big build-ups. Well, we need pace in a good, uplifting book as well. We need to be turning those pages and wondering how it's all going to end. Uh, so all those three three things are, are very much valid for this symphony. Before I dip into each one in turn, let me just set the scene for you. Uh, Sibelius is 50 in the year 1915, when this symphony first gets its airing in Helsinki. And by the way, it's a complete success. Everybody's up on their feet and uh, applauding madly. They absolutely love it. Frankly, they were relieved because the fourth symphony was more troubling, more dissonant. And Sibelius deliberately set out to do something he said more earthy and human with this fifth symphony, something with basically a wider popular appeal, and he achieved that. So he's riding high, you know, he's famous. He's 50, as I say, and everybody in the nation and internationally knows about him. He's a big deal. 
At the same time, though, in his personal correspondence to his friends, we find that he is, as he put it, deep in the mire, stuck deep in the mire. And he writes four times to his friend Axel Carpelin that he's struggling with God. And it's interesting that Sibelius, although not traditionally religious, has this sense of a compact with his creator, father figure. Uh, he sees God very much um, as a pantheist would in, in, in nature, mainly, but also in the creative process. You know, he talks of divine inspiration for so many of his biggest tunes from Finlandia, that, that hymn onwards. Um, and for this piece, he's really struggling with his creator spirit, if you like. Um, he talks of God just casting down a mosaic. Do you know this quote? Casting down a mosaic, scattering the pieces. And his job as a composer is to try and piece them together and make them into a whole again and rediscover the original divine vision that's been happening for this piece, which is a rather nice vision, isn't it? A rather nice picture <clears throat> or analogy, I should say. So there's a sense of struggle. Well, I should say to you that um, he does two revisions of this symphony. He's not happy with it initially. And four movements get turned into just three. So it's quite big revisions. Um, and the last version we come across in 1919, and that's the final version that we hear nowadays. I'm going to, by the way, refer you to a brilliant recording at the end of this talk, um, which features both the first, the original version of 1915, compared against the usual 1919 version. It's, it's absolutely uh, revelatory. So, three things to just focus our minds on. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, there will be a fourth snuck in right at the end for those of you who make it to the end of this half hour. Who's <laughs> make it until 3.30. And it's quite a sort of a beard stroking final point, I think. Anyway, let's start with the big tunes, shall we? And they don't get bigger than the so-called swan hymn. Now, many of you who know of this symphony will know what I'm about to say, but it behoves me to tell you this story anyway. In his diary, around the time of writing this symphony, he sees 16 swans. 16, not just a, a pair uh, just having another doodle <laughs> on a Sunday afternoon, um, but 16, a whole squadron of swans. I don't know what the collective noun is for swans. Do you? If you do, please write it in on the chat there. But anyway, a lovely mass of swans. And uh, he says, it's the great ex experience in my life. Oh God, what beauty, he says. They circled over me for a long time and disappeared into the hazy sun of theme. So a direct link to this swan hymn, as it was called by his friend, Axel Carpel. <clears throat> Let's open this up, hang on a sec. See what I'm doing. Um, I'm gonna point something out to you. So. Basically, we're drawn, aren't we, to that rocking motion. And immediately you see the swan's majestic sort of uh, rocking wings there. And that's given out by a pair of horns, which incidentally are the first predominant colour you hear in the symphony right at the beginning. Anyway, they come back here at this pivotal moment in the finale, in the finale with uh, a sense of wing-like motion. But, ladies and gentlemen, did you know this? That underneath, in the basses, we get this. In other words, the same theme, but given out in a different time frame. So you might think, it's rather like looking at those 16 swans. You can either focus on the wing movement of the horns, or you can see the great arc that sweep across the sky, that glittering silver ribbon that he talks about, this time actually given out in the basses. So two uh, sounds, or two planes of sound there, occupying different temporal frames. 
Also, you have just the strings holding on that, giving a sense of still stillness, maybe, and mystery. And over the top, this wonderfully free counter melody uh, that isn't as repetitious as any of the other ideas. You have... Let me just give you a sense of how the two main themes counterpoint each other. So. I've deliberately brought out that bass because we're not often focused on it. Now, let me just uh, play you the actual orchestral version. I hope this will work on my portable orchestra here. Let's just see what it's going to play. Can you hear that okay? Basses. Look, I'm here at home and I can't stop swaying. Are you swaying? I don't know. Roger's just put here that there's a bevy of swans here, not a squadron of swans. Thank you very much. Much less uh, militaristic and much more poetic. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> so, um, there you get the main tune. And already it's more complicated than you might think. But, but, notice it's just two chords really. It just goes between, right? just rocking between each other. Now, in this final moment, and do excuse the phone going off there, something I didn't think about in my life. Let me just turn that off a second, one second. <clears throat> I'm back, I'm back. That swan hymn feels very, very sort of complete, doesn't it? In, in of itself. It feels like a ready-made tune. Actually, um, <laughs> you know, wonderful things uh, always happen live. maybe, um, with a lovely dance and um, ring. Anyhow, I want to go back to the first second movements because um, whereas that is about arrival, you know, you really get this sense of arrival in the finale with that theme. The other two themes um, that I want to explain about um, in the first two movements are about a sense of becoming, right? And that is part of the um, it's just this sense of them unfurling in front of your ears. So let's just go to the first movement, right? And uh, I want to read for you another important quote. Remember I was talking to you about that sort of divine compact that Sibelius felt whenever he wrote music. Well, here he writes again to his friend Axel Carpenter. But I can already make out the mountain. I shall ascend. God is opening his doors for a moment and his orchestra is playing the fifth symphony. Um, what a wonderful sense of purpose to feel that you've reached heaven's gates and what you're hearing actually is your own symphony. Uh, a wonderful vision. So I think we get a sense of that, a sense of the heaven's gates opening right at the beginning. So um, it starts 
with this wonderfully open chord. Like this. Let me just go to the beginning. Right. Now that, as I said earlier, that's a horn call there. Doesn't that give you a sense of openness already? Like that. You know, if I were to do something like... It's not quite the same. We need that sense of those intervals, all, you know, part of it. And it gives you a sense of a slow fanfare. Um, but also in there is just a seed, a little fragment that we, will be developed. Just listen to this in the next bars. You can hear this, but um, first of all, first of all, what have you got in the underlay? Well, just like the Swan Hymn, which had two chords, here again, we just got two chords like that, just rocking. And if you were to sort of improvise over the top of that. Just a simple idea, right? The next thing, we could do something on the end. Something like that, right? And then, rather like sort of kneading out some dough, uh, you could add perhaps something on the beginning. You know, and, and we're off. Now, if you're wondering why on earth am I sort of improvising over a Sibelian symphony? Well, the name he first gave it actually was Fantasia Symphonica. A Fantasia, something that feels as if it's been made up in the moment. And a lot of this material speaks of that process, just gently teasing open an initial idea. Let's look at the second movement, right? And again, we're going to find that the same two chords are being rocked from one to the other. And over the top, we have just a very simple and hummable tune. And that's part of the magic. Um, let me just uh, get to listen to score. I'm using an iPad at the moment, <coughs> which sometimes I have to say, under my management at least, plays up. So let's see if I can just uh, find that moment. It's not playing ball, typically. So I'm just going to sort of go through annually like this. Bear with me, it's worth it. Okay, so we're talking about the second movement and about two chords. What are they? <coughs> Here they are. Can you hear that okay? And over the top, perhaps the most folkloric of all the melodies we'll hear in this. It's beautiful, it's quite circular isn't it? And if I play to you just a typical runic song um, from Finland, you'll hear, I think, a similar circular design and a simplicity to the chords underneath. Let's just listen to this.
Did you hear that? So you just had. <laughs> Just like that. And just, you know, two chords, and it's just going around and around. In fact, if I were to play you the whole of the piece, it does that, just circles. So you get the sense of that in this second movement as well. It's beautifully simple. And again, it's a theme and variation, so it just unfurls in front of your eyes. Let's go to the second point now. And um, if you remember, I was talking about three uplifting sort of criteria for this symphony. The tunes, the melodies, and how they work, how they unfurl. Second one was sort of um, a sense of uh, light winning over darkness. So this happens pretty much in every movement. It's not just a one-off event, but uh, typically, typically where we hear it at its most acute, is in the first movement. And I just want to play you this wonderful section from the first movement of storm music. Sibelius is great at writing storms. Those of you who know his final tone poem, Tapiola, uh, will remember how chilling and nightmarish that storm music is. And I can think of the Tempest, and in fact, quite a few passages from each of his symphonies. You could say, yeah, that's sort of uh, the equivalent of a storm in some way, whether directly or not. Let's just go to the first movement. I'm going to dip in roughly uh, four minutes in, so you can just hear some of that stormy music. Here we go. Strumming away in the strings. And quite heavy, right? Um, and that's a very motif for this first movement. And part of the thrill of this is how he will get over that. I'm just going to sort of jump to the end. Now, what you need to know is that in the first version, there were two movements, as you would expect from a standard symphony. It goes from the first movement into a scherzo. But here, he elides the two into one. When I say here, I mean the 1919 version, right? He aligns the two into one, and you get this wonderful sense of sort of going up and up into the light. And it is really, really uh, a beautiful transition. Going up in pitch, but also that sense of going from something very dark into something dazzling uh, and, and, and really, really bright. So um, this is the transition into the scherzo. I, I might just sort of beat along with it as well to give you a sense of how organic the shift in tempo is as well. Up and up. Here come the brass. Suddenly we get a sense of momentum. And it thins out. So I'm always skipping. I don't know about you. So we go from something incredibly intense and dense into a place of skipping and butterflies. Um, and it's so gradual. It's like a sort of a cross fade, isn't it, between one image and another. And he's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant at doing that. So there's a way uh, in which 
we go from darkness into light in just in that transition. And in the slow movement, I would say it's not about arriving again, but it's about getting there. It's a sense of sort of not there yet, of, of yearning. So there's sort of constant tension there as well. Let me just play you a bit, if I can, um, from the slow movement, which has a sort of a, a lovely romantic quality to some of it. Um, here, the strings, and he was a violin player, play this lovely tune. isn't it? And you could say, well, that is so resplendent. Surely we've arrived. Surely we're home. But no, in part of this sense of build-up, I'm going to my third point here, is that you have underneath it just these leaning couplets that upset a sense of being at home. They're, they're yearning for something more so against the tune. And they sort of intercut as well, just against the rhythm as well. And when you listen to so much of the argument in the slow movements, you'll hear often in the winds, either in the flutes, oboes, or horns these yearning figures, which means that when you do get to the end of this movement, it's a bit of an anti-ending because it hasn't been about arriving. It's been about the travel towards that moment. So right at the end, it's so throwaway. It's like this. You know, just down the sink. So the second movement, if you like, is all about build-up. And so we're on to the third criterion now for an uplifting piece. We're going to, you know, you know how it's going to finish because I've played you the swan hit of the third final movement already. Um, the build-up to that swan hymn, though, is part of the delight, because we start, don't we, with this, this great sense of busyness, like sort of honeybees, just buzzing around, joyfully, joyfully. There's a sense of, of it being a very happy, joyful build-up, like sort of marriage of Figaro makes me think of that. Completely different language, but the same sentiment, right? Now, let me just play you the opening here of that uh, final movement. <laughs> So busy in the strings, isn't it? That cross hatching effect, that shading that you get, uh, has to be very rhythmic and uh, probably gives you RSI, I would have thought. I don't know if any of the string players currently watching can attest to that. But with any Sibelius symphony, you know there's going to be a lot of tremolo um, or tremolando. And uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's quite tough on the wrists. Anyway, that's an aside. A wonderful sense of um, a frisson, right? right at the beginning of the movement, which will broaden out into the swan hymn later. Now if I go for my final point to the final statement of the entire symphony, there's a build-up of a different kind there. So this is about sort of building up electricity um, and a sense of momentum, perhaps, the broadness. And at the end, it's more of a build-up of sonorities that we enjoy. Yeah. It's amazing. I can't think of any other composer that does it quite like Sibelius because you have the brass doing one thing, the strings almost vying against them, and yet still it all works in this collage. And the woodwind again is a third sort of feature there. Um, and they're all sort of moving together uh, in the same kind of shapes, but just overlapping each other. And you get, as I say, this wonderful build-up of um, sonorities. And what is Sibelius's way of bringing a sense of closure after all that build-up? Will he just end with a thick, loud sound? 
Well, what he does is he saves his biggest surprise, doesn't he, to the end. And I have to say, this only happens in the 1919 version. If you listen to the original version, actually, it does stay thick and dense right until the end. But in the 1919 version, he does something incredibly radical. So here's the, the build-up. <clears throat> of space there between those final hammer blows, there's, there's six chords, and I always get an image of a fast liner, a cruiser boat, just coming slowly and judderingly to a halt in the dock, just finally coming slowly to a standstill. Um, but if you think about it, it's the perfect balancing uh, of all that density, all that build up uh, of momentum and build up of sound that precedes it. And the only way to go there, to have a sort of uh, an antithetical classical sense of balance, is to have silence. It's a great rhetorical device. You think if you do a crescendo in your speech right until the final moment and you're sort of making your final points, and then you have a wonderful moment of hesitation and reflection until you drive your final point home. And that's what he's doing, isn't it? He's using that rhetorical device. And I suppose that was my sort of beard stroking final fourth point as to why this is so inwardly satisfying as well. If you look at the symphony as a whole, structurally, it's absolutely beautifully put together. And there is this wonderful sense of integrity and balance. And I think it's most emphatic right in that final sentence. We have the build up sound counterpoised by the silence. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little diverting, I hope, uh, journey into Sibelius' Fifth Symphony. It's slightly more diverting, actually, than I was hoping, with the uh, phone going off not once but twice. But anyway, uh, forgive me for that. And do you agree? It'd be good to know. So we've got those big tunes, and you've got uh, the sense of lightness overcoming darkness, the sense of build-ups and structural beauty as well to behold. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for your thank yous that are coming through on the chat. I'm going to leave you now, but do please consider giving some donations to the Bristol Ensemble to keep this initiative going. Thank you for joining me now, and hope to see you again soon.
Thank you. 